News of the day. Mr. Zimmerman, have you made a decision as to whether or not you want to testify in this case? With values that never die. There are certainly a lot of controversies or scandals brewing right now when it comes to the Obama administration. This is American Heartland with Dr. Grace. Dealing with the federal government is not always high tech. And it's not always user friendly. The stories that matter. This is a massive escalation in the tension here in Egypt. The issues that count. I don't know why the media tries to make this into a sensation. We have never hidden the fact that we supply Syria with weapons. This is American Heartland with Dr. Grace. He's got the red, white, blue, flying high on a farm. Simplified tattooed on his left arm. Spend a little more. Welcome to American Heartline. This is Dr. Grace, the editor of Politics and Culture at WorldTribune.com, and I'm here upholding values that will never die. You know, this week we've had so much talk about the debt ceiling, the government shutdown, and so much of this, which basically is ephemeral, has drowned out a razor-sharp discussion of the huge catastrophe that is Obamacare. Obamacare has been described in words that are all synonyms for disaster. Train wreck is one of the most common, and rightly so. We are seeing now, from the very beginning, all of the failures that usually accompany government takeovers of anything. They promised us that they were going to improve the health care system. And right from the start, we can see that they can't even properly get it off the ground. And contrary to what the president is saying, the more people learn about this, the more deplorable the system is. Recently, Chris Wallace grilled Treasury Secretary Jack Lew, and he wanted to know one specific, simple question that would tell all of us if this is going to be a success or a failure. Out of the people that are going to the website, how many are enrolling in Obamacare? And what answer did he get? Do the American people know at what rate people are embracing this program? All we got was stonewalling and more stonewalling. Roll it, Brittany. I ask you about Obamacare. You brought it up. That's what, uh, what a lot of this is about. The public exchanges in Obamacare opened this week, and I think it's fair to say that the government website was a mess. In fact, and you can look at it right here, the page to sign up to enroll for Obamacare has been taken down for repairs during off-peak hours this weekend. Question, sir. You have had three years to prepare for this week. If I already had doubts, somebody already had doubts about the government's ability to oversee a sixth of the economy, shouldn't this just add to my doubts? You know, Chris, uh, I actually think that is not what's happened this week. What happened this week is we saw seven million people rush to go onto the web page to find out what are their choices in this new marketplace to buy affordable health How many actually signed up, sir? You know, they have six months to sign up. This is a big decision. We never expect. How many signed up? I, I don't have the exact number, but the question isn't. Do you how have many any number? Because the, the government has refused to question. tell us how many. It's the wrong question. No, it isn't. It, 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 in is the a, end, looking, the right I can look, and I may have no interest. Yeah. And in fact, I'm not going to need Obamacare. We know. The question is, Chris, how many people we, have we actually know. signed up? You know, they kept. They, they keep not wanting to answer this question when their very own actions have told us the truth. Just before the launch. They had advertisements running, and they were using celebrities, begging people to enroll. So obviously they knew that it was going to be a challenge to get people to enroll. And now they're telling us, well, don't believe your very own eyes. We can see that the web page says not loading, not working, come back later. Don't believe your very own eyes that from the start it's a catastrophe, it's grossly inefficient. And we've all been reading the reports about people who explore their options and decide they don't want to enroll, and that then they are met with very nasty messages saying that there's going to be penalties. We have your information now, and we're going to come after you with the full arm of the law. So we all know what's going on. What purpose does the Secretary Treasury think that he is fulfilling by blatantly lying to the American people? 
This is a, a truly erroneous way to proceed in the face of what is obviously a public relations nightmare for Obamacare. And that interview went on with the Treasury Secretary basically saying that what we're seeing right before our eyes isn't a failure, it's a success. Millions are rushing forward. Millions are interested. But still, at the end of the day, he can't give us the numbers that really prove how successful this program is. Roll it, Brittany. We know that people take time to make important decisions like this. They go on, they compare their options. The fact that so many millions of people rushed to get information is a very good sign. And your question about the website, I don't know about you, but um, you know, I sign on and, and, and I get updates on my software, and I often get corrections that I have to re, uh, re-update my, my software from major companies. Uh, it is not unique that when you have a very large new uh, software program come out that people work to clean it up. I usually wait till it's 0.3 or 0.4 before I sign up. So many millions of people rush to get in because that shows how much interest there is in, in getting I, I'm going to ask it one last time because, forgive me, sir, you haven't answered it. Do you not know how many people have signed up, which would seem to indicate another major software glitch, or is it that the number is embarrassingly small? Chris, I, our metric for this week was could people get online, get the information they the need they to make an, enforce, an, an informed decision. They have been getting that information. We are confident that they're going to make the decision as we expect. They have six months to make the decision. So you don't, do, do, they, do you not know or is it that the number is small? Well, it, it's obviously not my primary area of responsibility. So uh, my knowing or not knowing is not, is not going to be indicative. Okay. Nobody they, you know, that's a peculiar way to, to mount a defense. First, he gives us one set of numbers, but he denies that he uh, it's res- his responsibility to know the other set. Again, what we are seeing here is a huge failure unfolding right before our very eyes. And instead of taking the life jacket that Republicans are throwing at them, they're saying, listen, It's obvious this program is going to fail. The American people are demanding that you reform it, and we're actually going to give you an opportunity to reform it. In fact, you can save face during this embarrassing fiasco by saying not that the program itself was such a catastrophe in the rollout. You could say, well, the people through the Republican Party and other venues were demanding reforms, and therefore we accommodated accommodated their needs. Instead, what they're doing is they're allowing the disaster to continue to unfold while defending it, which makes them look grossly incompetent. And they're all on the same talking points. We heard the same blarney, basically, from the White House press secretary, Jay Carney where they keep trying to tell us that just like in the private marketplace, when there's such a high demand, sometimes it takes a little bit of time to get the product that you want. Everybody knows that this usually doesn't apply to government operations. Roll it, Brittany. Uh, as of now, I still have, uh, in the first 72 hours, uh, healthcare.gov had over 8.6 million unique Uh, visitors. As you know, there were seven times more users on the Marketplace website first morning than have ever been on the Medicare.gov site at one time. But you still don't know how many people have signed up? I'm glad you asked that question because uh, I want to be clear about it. Uh, When it comes to enrollment data, you know, I want to clear this up. We will release data on regular regular monthly intervals, just like uh, was done in Massachusetts and just like what was done and is done when it comes to Medicare Part D. Uh, what I can confirm right now is that people are signing up through federal exchanges. So we now are going to have to wait one month at a time, and it really will be interesting to see what kind of spin they put on those embarrassingly low numbers when they come out at the end of every month. And again, even Jay Carney said the same thing that Jack Lew was saying, that the reason they're having so many problems is due to the unbelievable interest that the American people are expressing. Roll it, Brittany. People go to the website, but not how many people... Again, this is, these are, these are, this is large volume. There's no question that there's large volume. And, we're, and these are rough estimates about the volume. Uh, one of the reasons why we've been able to... Uh, why we've provided the information about the volume is because it is the principal reason why we've had slowdowns and and other issues that we've had to try to resolve 
uh, to make the consumer experience better. Didn't they tell us that there were 30 million uninsured that desperately needed insurance? Hence, didn't they tell us that this program was going to be ready for these millions? Meaning that, hello, you are expecting millions of people to go to your website. So now you're telling us, oh, this is such good news because millions of people did come, but the website crashed. They're not even making any sense by the very own things that they say they are hanging themselves. They were supposed to have a website ready, ready to go for 30 million people. And at best, they're telling us that about eight or so million people are tuning into that website and that nonetheless, the website is crashing and they still want us to believe it's because of the overwhelming amount of interest. If what they're saying is true, that would be the case if not 30 million people were logging on, but 50, 60, 70, 80, much more than they expected. The party here was supposed to be for 30 million. And you can't even accommodate by your own numbers the eight that are coming. So much so that you're talking about reworking the entire software at night, in the dark of night. You've got to rework something that you just launched. What a catastrophe. How embarrassing. And the best that they can do is spin to us that nonetheless, this whole thing is absolutely marvelous. It's a quote unquote, high class problem. Roll it, Brittany. Unquestionably, the case is that there has been uh, an enormous amount of interest, as we've seen by the number of people who have visited the website. Uh, And it's kind of like people who are trying to get tickets to the first Pirates home playoff game, right? I mean, you know when you go on site and it's hard to load the page that it's because a lot of people like you uh, want to find out if tickets are available. And the great news about this uh, is it's not one game, it's not one night. The seats are unlimited and the availability will be there for every American family that wants affordable health insurance. So, you know, we take this as uh, Bill Clinton used to say as a high class problem. You know, it's not a high-class problem. In reality, it's a low-class problem. When you show this kind of inefficiency right from the start, it bodes very ill for your entire program. And what we can clearly see is that the president of the United States wanted to have a grand legacy here. Finally, he was going to do what the Democrats have been clamoring for for 70 years. And instead of making health care better, right from the start, we can see that it is a colossal entanglement. We're all getting entangled in this gross inefficiency. And to cover that up, we're getting entangled in all this spin and all these lies. And we see right before our eyes that the President of the United States has acted like a very foolish individual, taking a wrecking ball to the greatest healthcare system the world has ever seen in order to do something that he thought would make him grand in the history books. Instead, what is really happening is, along with all the other scandals that he's endured in his second term, It is diminishing his standing. It is diminishing his credibility. It is diminishing his aura. And more and more of us can see that he is incompetent and rather foolish. Right before our eyes, we are seeing that when the government takes over an institution, things get very slow very quickly and whatever used to work suddenly stops working this is the mark of a stupid man it's like holding back the wind she let her heart so right in your hands and you stole her every dream and you crushed her Telling her she can't Stupid boy News of the day with values that never die The stories that matter, the issues that count This is American Heartland with Dr. Grace I can live a lie running for my life I will always want you I came in like a wrecking ball I never 
Welcome back to American Heartland. This is Dr. Grace, the editor of Politics and Culture at WorldTribune.com. You know, it seems like the theme of this show is wreckage. In the first segment, we explored how the President of the United States and his party is slowly wrecking the greatest health care system the world has ever known and that they're denying it as they're doing it. And now I'd like to explore another form of wreckage, one that I'm all too familiar with. This one is a little bit more surprising because in this case, it's not the government that is doing this wreckage. It's a private corporation, a private company, and one that has been excellent so far. I am talking about Fox News. And before I explain why I am so troubled by recent developments, I want to preface it all by saying that I'm a huge fan of the network. I have been for decades, basically since it was launched. When it was launched in the 1990s, it quickly eclipsed CNN. CNN had be, it, it used to present itself as an objective news network, but it quickly became simply a mouthpiece for the administration of Bill Clinton. And when Fox News broke onto the scene, so many of us conservatives latched onto it for dear life. Oh, here, finally, we could get the alternate point of view. Even though they keep saying that they're fair and balanced, it was very obvious that at last conservatism could be presented and the news could be given to all of us that were desperately craving an alternative to the Clinton News Network. Um, and I've watched the network grow across the years, and for the most part... I've remained an ardent fan, yet recently I am absolutely shocked and dismayed at what is going on. It seems like this network is slowly committing suicide, a self-inflicted death, I think, which I, I believe you're going to see over the course of the next decade or so, if my prophecy here is going to be correct. But we're seeing Fox News suddenly going soft. It's beginning to lose its identity. This week, they have uh, unfurled a whole new lineup. Greta Van Susteren is now at 7 o'clock. Bill O'Reilly remains at 8 o'clock. He has the top-rated cable show in the country, and he has had that for 14 years. Um, and uh, the other thing that they're doing is they have taken Hannity out of his nine o'clock slot. He's going to appear much later. And instead of Hannity, we have Megan Kelly, who is now going to be in prime time. So they've transformed their prime time lineup. And what have they done? Have they strengthened this prime time lineup with stronger conservative voices? Or have they weakened it? I think that the evidence is clear. What you're seeing at Fox News is they're slowly muzzling the conservative voices they're in. And I've seen this done in other news organizations. One of the tactics that is used is you take somebody, for example, that is highly opinionated, that has strong conservative points of view. And you put that person in a box, in a box where they're supposed to, instead of being opinion commentators, they have to simply report only the news in an objective fashion. In fact, that very thing was done to yours truly. That's why I say I know this. I know these tactics. I was one of the leading editorial writers at the Washington Times. And due to uh, a shakeup that occurred at the Times... The upper management knew that I was highly conservative. I was then transformed, given a promotion. And in my column, I wrote a column on the military community, but I was told that that column had to be a news column. Now, I was grateful for the opportunity to uh, address the needs of the military community, but I also knew that that strong conservative presence of mine was now being put in a tiny little box. The higher-ups were trying to, and they did it because I was working for them, silence another 
fervent conservative, but doing it in a way that it could go almost unperceived. What have they done here with taking Hannity out of the nine o'clock slot and put Megyn Kelly there? Now, I have nothing against Megyn Kelly. I'm actually a fan of hers. I've enjoyed her broadcast during the daytime. And when I was when I heard that she was going to be an a key element of the prime time slot, I was really excited. I thought, well, maybe Hannity will be moved, but she is going to, you know, exercise her vibrant personality in that prime time slot and really advance conservative ideas. Instead, Megan Kelly is now simply to report the news at nine o'clock in more or less an objective fashion. So the strong conservative presence of Hannity, who, by the way, is more of a Republican hack, you might say, than an actual conservative, but at least his show was highly opinionated, that is being pushed to the side in favor of Megyn Kelly. And this is what her new show will be all about. Roll it, Brittany. It's going to be a live broadcast, and so it's going to be a news program, a breaking news program, not an opinion program, so I'm not going to be the, uh, the female Bill. You should be. You should be. But you're going to have to give your opinion. as that is. You're going to have to give your opinion sometimes because there are going to be well, so many pinheads and you're going to have to go, this is insane. Listen, you're gonna I have already to do, do that. that on my afternoon show, but that's, right. that's not a risky proposition. When I see somebody driving like, you know, 100 miles an hour on the sidewalk endangering families on my afternoon show, I, as a news sure. maker, I've said that's a moron and that's not particularly controversial. As a legal uh, expert, but I practiced law for nine years, I feel comfortable giving my legal Are you going to do a lot of legal stuff? We'll do some legal stuff, yeah. yeah. But I mean, I'm not going to be somebody like you who's going to outline what needs to happen with the sequester and the showdown and all that. And that's not going to be what I'm there for. But I will present both sides of the view. I want to do it smartly. I want to do it succinctly. I want to synopsize the news for There you go. Whenever you hear that somebody is going to present both sides, well, they have to then tow this objective line. They have to be objective. Presenting both sides means that, well, you, you might give the conservative view, viewpoint some hearing, but essentially this is a much softer exposition of the conservative viewpoint than Hannity represented. And like I said, I was a critic of Hannity. I mean, I appreciated that he could stand his ground sometimes, but overall I found him to be much more of a Republican hack than an absolute independent conservative. And even that, it seems, is now too much for Fox News because he's being pushed to 10 o'clock. And all we get now at 9 o'clock is the sweet-faced Megyn Kelly that's going to try to present it right down the line for us. That is a mistake for Fox News because someone like me, and I speak for millions who have given this network its top-rated slot, in terms of uh, being the highest rated uh, cable news network in the country, we're going to tune out. We're going to tune out. By then, by 9 o'clock, we already know the news. We don't need somebody to tell us that. What we're looking for is confrontation, is opinion, is fireworks. Who tunes in at 9 o'clock to find out what happened in the day? By then, we've heard it several times, especially all of us news junkies that have been covering it since 6 o'clock in the morning. So I don't know who's advising Fox News, but this is a mistake. And an even bigger mistake is they are going to the other networks to bring in talents, quote unquote talent. Guess who now they have, you know, poached from another network to join their morning lineup on Fox and Friends. None other than the hard hitting journalist Elizabeth Hasselback. That'll put fear and loathing in any liberal. I say that tongue in cheek. Look, she was on The View and she occasionally presented a conservative viewpoint and she was a minority going up against other ladies that were clearly completely in the tank for liberalism. So she stood out. But is this some kind of great conservative woman that we have poached from another network. Look at how she's introduced herself. Roll it, Brittany. 
Hey everyone, I am so excited to share a morning with you here on Fox and Friends with Stephen Bryan and we cannot wait to have nothing but a good time. Stephen Bryan could not be more friendly and welcoming and informative. I think Bryan already challenged me to a couple of, of races outside, uh, maybe high-heeled football, I'm not sure. I need some room. <laughs> I feel like they're my brothers. Joining the, the Fox News family is the equivalent of growing up as you know, a Boston Red Sox fan or a Yankees fan and then being asked to play for the team. This is an honor and a privilege and I'm just, I'm beyond thrilled to be on the team. Are you all still awake out there? Look, as an introduction, this is appalling. First of all, she talks about having a good time. She talks about the banter that she's gonna have with her co-hosts. She talks about football and high heels. And what does this tell us? That she's trying to sell only her personality. We don't care about personality. We care about what you stand for. We care about your expertise, your knowledge, your hard work. What do you bring to the table? I don't want to see a bubbly personality. I don't care about personality. I mean, if you recall the way that I started this broadcast when we started this show, I identified these are my core convictions. I'm doing a service, I believe, to all those who share the conviction so we can band together and we can make a positive change. So you don't care about my personality. I don't care about my personality. We're not here to make friends. This is not friends. Uh, Fox News broadcast is not about creating a community of uh, bubbly personalities and friends that we all hang out together. We are here to expose the truth, to defend the truth, to change this country in a moment of crisis. And of all the people that you reach out to to poach from another network, Elizabeth Hasselbeck? Uh, honestly, this is another really bad decision. And you know what? You can see on her face. I don't know if any of you have seen it. And there have actually been some articles written on it. She has quickly grasped, number one, she's out of her league. She was, she's not really that informed. She's not really up to speed on the issues. So she was good where she was. She should have been left there as a conservative voice, a kind of, you know, I would say a rather, you know, light conservative voice on other networks. There she stood out. There she had some kind of a role. But on a station with really serious heavyweights on it, she seems like a tiny little dwarf. She seems stupid. She's out of her league. And that's not going to win any more viewers to the morning show. Another big mistake for Fox News. More on this mess when we come right back. This is American Heartland with Dr. Grace. The stories that matter, the issues that count. This is American Heartland with Dr. Grace. Welcome back to American Heartland with Dr. Grace. I am the editor of politics and culture at worldtribune.com. And today I am in agony because I'm seeing the slow motion wreckage of Fox News. In the previous segment, we talked about how Megyn Kelly is going to do objective news at 9 o'clock on Fox, kicking Hannity out of that slot. We talked about the addition of Elizabeth Hasselbeck to the morning program, which, as you can tell, I'm not such a huge fan of her, especially in a moment of national crisis and so many pressing issues that they would poach someone that is a lightweight. There's no other word to say it, to, to express it properly. 
And you know, what else has Fox News done? They have also poached George Will. Now, some of you will say, well, Dr. Grace, what do you have against George Will for crying out loud? Look, George Will is another one of those individuals that on other networks was somewhat useful to counteract the liberalism. But he survived on those networks all those years. He was on ABC. He was on uh, This Week with George Stephanopoulos. He survived for years and years, not because he's a bold, brilliant, honest, forthright conservative. He survived all those years because he's a safe conservative. And there's another thing about George Will. George Will is passé. Who still reads George Will? I haven't read George Will in years. He's on his way down. You don't pick people. You don't poach people from other networks when the best years are already done. And what is it about George Will? He basically only says one thing. He's got one point in him. And that point is a good one. But after 20 years, when you've heard it, you don't need to hear it anymore. Let me summarize it for you. The government is too big. That's what George Will says. He has said it a hundred different ways, using historical examples sometimes, which are witty and amusing, but that's all he's got to say. And he's not strong enough, bold enough, courageous enough to combat the demons we are facing in our midst today. Listen to his debut analysis on Fox News. This is a sample. Roll it, Brittany. I don't see immigration getting down. I mean, it's becoming axiomatic that you can't get anything done in America during an election year or the year before an election year, which is all years taken together. But with, about the split in the Republican Party, I mean, what else is new? They split in 1912 between Taft, President Taft and Teddy Roosevelt. They split in 64 between the Goldwaterites and the Rockefellers. It's a big country, and the Republicans now have what liberals are supposed to admire, which is diversity, except liberals don't want diversity in thought, and that's what the Republicans now have, and it makes them rather interesting. You see, when somebody says that something is interesting, that's not saying anything about them. So what does, what's George Will shtick? He throws in some historical examples, but he doesn't really say anything. Which side of this Republican divide are you on? Why don't you say something interesting, something bold, something courageous? That's why I'm not a fan of George Will. He's a safe conservative. And he's part of the problem. He's part of the go-along, get-along crowd that has led us to this impasse in our nation. And... He's not one of those bold voices that you hear. Basically, now you only hear them on radio. That's one of the last areas where people speak freely, where the truth truly comes out. So what has Fox News done? They've got George Will, Elizabeth Hasselbeck, and Megyn Kelly. Is that the army that we're going to fight the culture wars with? Is that the army that we're going to fight socialism with because this is what's going on in this country and is that the best that we can do i am deeply concerned because this is another example of a good institution going bad of a conservative and important voice slowly being transformed when we talk about the gradual, ongoing, perpetual, endless, leftward shift in our culture, this is how it happens. An institution that is previously conservative is slowly sabotaged from within. And it's always sabotaged from within with people saying that this is a good path to take, that this is the future, that this is the way to go forward that this is the bright path to take, when in reality, all of us can see that in all of these choices, they're taking a wrecking ball to their brand. And, you know, one of the things that Fox News has done is they've unfurled this big, flashy set. So now they're going to have this big set. Do you watch Fox News because you want to see a great set? Listen to how Shepard Smith is so proud of the new set that they're unfolding. 
Roll it, Brittany. Welcome to the Fox News deck at Fox News headquarters in New York. It's in this building 17 years ago that Fox News revolutionized the way broadcast news is presented to the people. And it's in this room that we plan to do it all over again. It's been almost a month since I signed off for the last time from Fox Report. And what's happened in this studio since then has been nothing short of extraordinary. Construction crews, computer programmers, and journalists have been working around the clock to build the Fox News deck. From the lights to the floor, everything has changed, and for good reason, because you've changed as well. Viewing patterns are changing, uh, the way people consume news is, in, is changing. Um, people aren't so linear. They don't sit down and watch TV at a certain hour, you know, and stick with the same thing from show to show to show. You're tuning in on your time. And you're looking for more than just a recap of the stories you've followed all day. We're trying to fuse the old way of doing TV news with this new reality, which is smartphones, apps, the internet, your computer. Just like you, we get our news across multiple platforms. Do you watch Fox News because of the lighting, because of the set? I mean, if you think of one of the most successful, uh, some of the most successful shows uh, that, that cover the news, Charlie Rose, he just has a very plain table. Uh, Larry King used to have one of the best interview shows in the nation um, back in the day, several decades ago until his, his gradual decline. And that was a very simple set. Uh, you look at O'Reilly, who has the top-rated cable news show. That's not a very complicated set. We, we're not look, we don't need an action movie at six o'clock at night we want to hear the news we don't need uh, the latest graphics we don't need sound and furry we need a reliable reporter giving us breaking news that is well sourced and that presents an alternative to the liberal media that's what we're looking for fox news we don't need flashing lights and bright floors and big decks and another thing we don't need you to be immersed in so much technology. We don't need you to add to the confusion of our day. We need you to make it more relaxing. We need you to make it simple and comprehensible, not cluttered. You know, that, that rollout to me, that sounds like, oh, my God, you're going to clutter the news. That's what you're going to do. You're going to make it so that we can't really get into one particular story. It's not that complicated. News requires a person of integrity, knowledge, and skill, period. And you watch the news, mostly you relate to a person that you end up trusting. And that's all it takes. It's the person that you really tune in for, how they deliver it, and whether or not they have good judgment. Have they made good judgment in their story selection? That's why you tune in. Speaking of which, they're about to wreck another show that I absolutely love. If you ask me this question, Dr. Grace, what is your favorite show on television? You'll be surprised at my response. My favorite show on television is Special Report with Brett Baer. I know, I know. Some of you are thinking this is one news junkie, but I'm telling you the God's truth. I really enjoy Brett Baer. And you know what it is about Brett Baer? He took over from Brit Hume, and I know him. I know of him very well. This is a man who is a man of deep faith. He's got excellent judgment. His news broadcast has been extraordinary, and he usually starts off with a really gripping headline story, and he usually nails it. He usually nails the story of the day. He's got that lead, and he is extremely informed. After the news segment, there's an opinion segment. And in that opinion segment, he's very good at getting the best out of the panelists. And he's good because he's extremely informed. His heart is in the right place. His mind is in the right place. He's a man of courage and a man of judgment. I really like Brett Bear, But it looks like they're getting to Brett Bear too. And, you know, I can relate. Like I said, I've been a conservative in the media with the powers that be telling you you should do it a different way. And that's what's happening to Brett Bear. And I can see it on his face and I can read it in his eyes. If you notice, his leads are getting softer and weaker. It's not the same Brett Bear. He is slowly being muzzled. He's being told, tone it down. And now they're going to get him with something else. 
technology. They have launched this insane, stupid, idiotic mechanism on special report with Brett Baer. Listen to Brett Baer explaining it. Roll it. Let's take a moment to walk you through how you can have a seat at the panel. First, you need to go to bing.com slash politics on your home computer or even a handheld device. Once on the page, pick your political affiliation. There are three options for this one, Republican, Democrat, or Independent. We'll click Independent. Then state your gender, male or female, of course. Now you are on the panel, too. As the discussion begins, you can have your say. You can vote, and vote often, every five seconds if you'd like. Just click one of the five buttons on the screen, ranging from strongly disagree to strongly agree. So guess what? Instead of just watching Brett Bear, we also have this mechanism now at the bottom of the screen when the panel comes on that tells us how the viewers are reacting to what the panelists are saying. Is this at all interesting or enticing to you? Here again, we add confusion and chaos. And also, it's an attempt to make the news more democratic. That's an oxymoron. The news is not democratic. We want an authoritative figure to tell us the news. If I want to know what everybody else thinks about the news, I'm going to pick up the phone. I'm going to call my sister. I'm going to call my niece. I'm going to call my friends. And I'm going to ask them, hey, what did you think of what Krothheimer said today? I don't want to see what the rest of America is thinking as I'm trying to untangle what Krothheimer and everybody else on the panel is saying. You're making the news you're, you're dumbing it down by doing that. You're introducing an element of democracy, so-called, that doesn't belong there. The news is supposed to be authoritative from somebody that you trust. And when the opinion panel comes on, what we're enjoying is seeing the interaction between them. When you add everybody else, now you just have chaos. And on top of that, you have that stupid ticker that tells you other news that's going on. So basically, I'm here complaining. They are wrecking, wrecking special report with Brett Baer. And that too is a way of diluting its content. Because instead of focusing on conservatism, we're going to get independents and Democrats weighing in on what everybody else is saying. Who cares what Democrats and independents are saying and thinking and feeling? And that's not what I watch Fox News for. But yet they think this is a great revolution. Roll it, Brittany. It's a first for an evening news program, something you can take part in. And we have partnered up with our friends at Bing to bring it to you. This is the first ever time where Americans get to sit in their living room or look at their phone and watch Fox and vote real time on what's happening. It's revolutionary in how we're going to watch television. We had more than 12 million votes during the State of the Union and it worked right. and people said this is great I get a chance to actually talk back and we said what else could we do this with? What else can they do with it with? Wreck one of the greatest shows on television. Wreck one of the greatest news broadcasts on television. That's what they're doing. They're bringing independents and Democrats onto our turf to infiltrate and push the network further and further towards the left. Sadly, Fox News is slowly being destroyed. It's being sabotaged. It's being submerged in this liberal culture. And I'm very, very sad to see this unfold. Don't cry, don't cry. You're listening to American Heartland with Dr. Grace. The stories that matter, the issues that count. This is American Heartland with Dr. Grace. That's what's going on. Nothing's fine, I'm torn. I'm all out of faith. This is how I feel. I'm cold and I am shamed. Lying naked on the floor. Welcome back to American Heartland with Dr. Grace. I am your host, the editor of Politics and Culture at WorldTribune.com. By the way, if you love American Heartland, just go to YouTube. Every single episode we have ever done is there so you can listen in. You know, it seems that the theme that we have running through every single segment is that of destruction. 
government in, government destroying institutions, private institutions destroying themselves. And this story is another heart wrencher. You have a reverend, Reverend Gary Hall, who um, has made a statement. He's at the National Cathedral in Washington, D.C. That is considered the nation's house of prayer. It's a beautiful church. It is a church where funeral services are held there. Um, It is a church that really captures the nation's attention in key moments. And this reverend, Reverend Gary Hall, has basically launched a new frontier in our culture war. Listen to what he said. Church came to its senses over time and labeled both racism and sexism as sinful. And now we find ourselves at this last barrier about human identity. You can call that barrier homophobia. You can call that barrier heterosexism. But we must now have the courage to take the final step and to call homophobia and heterosexism what they are. They are sin. Homophobia is a sin. Heterosexism is a sin. Shaming people for whom they love is a sin. Shaming people because their gender identity does not fit neatly into your sense of what it should be is a sin. This is one of the most disturbing statements I have ever heard. And what it shows is that the homosexual agenda is penetrating our churches and there is an attempt now even to rewrite biblical teachings themselves if you have a church leader saying this this demonstrates that unless we christians fervently boldly and uncompromisingly reclaim the language of the bible we will be dwarfed by this destructive liberal culture. Essentially, this reverend has adopted the paradigm of liberalism. He has adopted the worldview of liberalism. He has adopted the language of liberalism. And he's trying to marry that to Christianity by saying that homophobia, quote unquote, is a sin. This is a complete inversion of what Jesus taught. I don't even know where to begin. It will take me, it would take me several hours to explain how wrong this is, but I'll try to be as succinct as I can. The words homosexuality and heterosexuality are words that are a trap because nobody is a homosexual or a heterosexual. Those very words lead you down the liberal paradigm, the liberal worldview. The Christian understands only one thing. There are individuals and we are all made in the image and likeness of God. And there are individuals who do good and there are individuals who sin. And many of us have both of those elements in our character. There are good deeds and sinful deeds. None of us are or should be defined by what we do sexually. No one speaks that way except for the homosexuals and the lesbians where they define themselves by a sexual act. Does the rest of society say, uh, you know, uh, I'm a masturbator. Uh, I'm a premarital sexer. Uh, I'm an adulterer. Nobody speaks that way, which means that The rest of us understand that asexual act or repeated sexual acts do not define any of us. God has defined us as human beings with a soul made in his image and likeness. And there are some acts that are wholesome and good that he smiles upon. They are wholesome, even sexually, as he created sexual activity and made it pleasurable. 
Hence, he knows what he's doing and how it should work. And there are other acts of a sexual nature when they are performed, whether it's a man and a man or a man and a woman, those acts are repulsive in his eyes. Sodomy is the word that was traditionally used. And that is a word that we have to use when we talk about this. Don't let anybody ever let you talk about homosexual or gay or heterosexual, straight. All these terms, all these terms are a trap. Because there are people who perform acts. And some acts, like sodomy, are deplorable. Whether they are performed by two men or whether they are performed by a man and a woman. Because nowadays, many men and women are engaging in sodomy. And this preacher should have been explaining that so I don't have to. Because frankly, it shames me. I feel a little bit ashamed to use these words. I was raised in a Victorian household. But unfortunately, I have to talk about these things because our priests don't do a good job. Or when they talk about it, they are leading us astray. They are being brainwashed by this liberalism and their own historical ignorance and their own lack of knowledge about the proper use of words. None of us who reject the act of sodomy are homophobic. We are simply saying that that act is unnatural It is sinful. It is displeasing. And that has been laid out clearly in the Bible. Just read it. But it's not only that act. It is premarital sex that is condemned. It is adultery that is condemned. It is sinful thoughts that are condemned. It is looking at it, if you're married, looking at somebody else with lust that is displeasing in God's eyes. All of these are acts. They don't define us. You know why they don't define us? Because the Christian creed is one of love and forgiveness. So when we fall astray astray in prayer, in confession, we try to get back on the path that is pleasing to the Lord. So to truly be loving of a person who has an inclination towards sodomy, we should tell them, this is leading you astray. It is not good for you physically. And it is not good for you morally and spiritually. And it is not good even if a man and a woman do it. It is not good, period. And you're not a pariah. You're not somebody to be despised. Because all of us sin in some way, shape, or form. But the beauty here is if you recognize what sin is, you call it by name. You have a chance to go back on the virtuous path. And instead, this reverend is destroying central church teaching. Listen to what else he had to say. Roll it, Brittany. Only when all of our churches can say that clearly and boldly and courageously will our LGBT youth be free to grow up in a culture that totally embraces them fully as they are. Our LGBT youth? Again, Can you show me where in the Bible it says LGBT youth? Show me that. Show me where in the Bible you're going to see homosexual, heterosexual. Reverend, you've lost your mind. There's no other way of saying it. This man should be fired. He's not only inverting biblical teaching, he's saying all the churches should have that teaching. This is really disturbing. I ask all of you to call the National Cathedral and demand that this man be fired. And let us begin by reclaiming our language. And we must also begin by teaching man and woman that even within marriage, even if you are faithful and loyal to one another, Some sexual acts that you perform are displeasing to the Lord. Because if you think that your body is your object, you are showing a great act of pride. Your body is a temple. It is a temple for your soul. And the great battle that you face every single day is how to save that soul and when you perform acts that defile the body you imperil your soul 
This is Dr. Grace, having to uphold values that will never die because our church leaders are doing an abysmal job at it. Well, if you ask me where I come from, here's what I tell everyone. I was born by God's dear grace in an extraordinary place. With the stars and stripes And the eagle fly This is America's voice for conservative values Dr. Grace